So if everybody will mute, if everybody will go on mute until I finish, please. Thank you. Uh, Jim, can you go on mute? Thank you. So I'm gonna give it two minutes, Lisa, and I'll begin. Good afternoon. My name is James Buchanan, and I am the director of the Brueggemann Center for Dialogue at Xavier University. On behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to welcome those of you who joined us last week and those of you who are joining us for the first time today. The theme this week is finding peace in a time of anxiety. I think we will all agree that this transition into whatever our new sheltering in place place lives may be, has been both disruptive and unsettling. It has been challenging to find peace of mind as we see the suffering that COVID-19 has brought to so many. As we feel the uncertainty about when this might be over and what the new normal might be. The stress of isolation, the new financial concerns for ourselves, our families, our businesses, and our country all add to the burden we carry alone and collectively. The constant political bickering on television and the growing tensions between public health and restarting the economy continue to shake our sense of inner peace as we struggle with an uncertain future that, and what awaits us on the other side. Where do we turn in such times? Well, certainly to each other, but also to our faith communities. We look to them for wisdom and guidance, and through reflection, meditation, and prayer, we hope that they might act as a guide that leads us into a new and maybe more profound path of inner peace. The nonprofit organization Equation, which grew out of the Bridges of Faith Trialogue, along with the Cincinnati Festival of Faiths, the Jacob Rader Marcus Center for American Jewish Archives at the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, and the Brueggemann Center for Dialogue at Xavier University have created a four-week webinar series which features leaders from some of our many regional world religions that they might share brief inspirational reflections or prayers to help us find some measure of inner peace in these times of anxiety. Today, we are blessed to have with us the Right Reverend Thomas E. Bridenthal, who is the Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Southern Ohio, Aruni Maropani, member of the Cincinnati Buddhist, Buddhist community, Reverend Jim Newby, who is the pastor of the Cincinnati Friends Meeting, Reverend Connie Simon, who is pastor at the First Unitarian Church, and Deborah Vance, PhD, member of the Baha'i community of Cincinnati. I will call upon them, one and each will offer their reflections on wisdoms of prayer. For the audience, first, let, we cannot see you and you are muted. If you have comments or questions, we encourage you to share these with the group. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see two buttons. One says chat and one says Q&A. If you have a comment, please use chat. If you have a question, please use the question button. If your question is for a particular plant, panelist, please address it to them. If it's for the panel as a whole, just ask the question. After all of our panelists have spoken, 
Um, I will choose a few questions, usually combining some that have been asked for to respond. We're being respectful of time. It is unlikely we will get to them all, but what we will try to do is after the fact, capture those and respond to them individually to the, to the person who's written them. So let me begin first by calling on the, on the first of our panelists, which is the right Reverend Thomas E. Bridenthal, Bishop Bridenthal. Thank you very much. I've been thinking a lot about um, lament and hope these days and the relationship between them perhaps partly because uh, my younger daughter, Lucy, who deals with a uh, young family and uh, children issues at a, a pretty big Episcopal church in New York City, has been cooped up with her wonderful husband and brand new daughter uh, for weeks now and has been churning out all kinds of materials for learning and uh, study. But the one that really struck me that I just read a few days ago um, was calling up the fact that we, probably all of us, are dealing with a lot more grief than we might want to admit to. Um, it, it's uh, hard to take our own losses seriously when we think about people who have lost their jobs or their livelihood or their state, their statehood or their homes, uh, but indeed, the small losses that come with uh, sheltering in place can add up. Um, not being able to go to a restaurant that we like, not being able to have a basketball game with some friends, and, um, and the list goes on and on. So we don't talk about the, that kind of grief very much because we may think that it's petty. But in, in fact, um, it's not petty. It's really important for us, especially in a time like this, to be able to talk about the things that we are lamenting, the losses that we are lamenting, but also to balance that with uh, the hopes that we have. And what has occurred to me um, it, it, more powerfully than I, I think it has before is how closely related lament is to hope because we grieve over the loss of things that really matter to us and we hope and yearn for the things that we really want. And the, so the two arise out of a very similar place in our hearts. Speaking as a, as a Christian, we're right in the middle of our 50 days of the Easter season. And um, as I read through the scriptures that relate to the accounts of the rise of Jesus, um, I am struck by the extent to which they demonstrate the close relationship between lament and hope. Uh, today in, in our churches, we read the story of two disciples making their way from Jerusalem to, to um, a small town called Emmaus, and um, they're, they're lamenting the death of Jesus, and Jesus comes, risen from the dead, comes up alongside them and says, what are you worrying about? What are you talking about? So they tell him, and he starts explaining to them all the things in the Hebrew scriptures that could have pointed to what was happening. And so eventually he joins them in their home and they break bread together and they recognize him and he disappears. So there is your lament and hope all brought right together. And I, it seems to me that probably we need not so much to, as Christians, to separate Lent from Easter, but to see that the season of Lent and the season of Easter are inextricably connected to one another as we learn in the midst of our anxiety and our fearfulness to be awake and open to the, the, the hope that God in all of our different religious traditions offers us. Thank you, Reverend Breidenthal. And next I'd like to call on Aruni Maropani. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, yes. all right. Um, yeah, so blessings to all of you and thank you so much for having me today. Uh, I am a Buddhist chaplain and this is a little bit about how uh, the Buddhist communities around the world are um, practicing and applying what their teachings um, in this um, crisis time and find peace um, and balancing their minds. Uh, first of all, um, the prayers 
uh, just like any other faith, uh, the Buddhist communities are also praying and chanting. And the most important thing they are praying right now, the most important thing, uh, important sutra or discourse is loving kindness meditation and compassion meditation. Um, by doing so, um, they are, we are sending uh, loving kindness energy to all sentient beings. Uh, so this is being happening 24 uh, seven around the world in all Buddhist communi uh, communities. Um, and it's, it's very soothing. And um, we are um, praying for healing, peace, harmony and balance in the world. Um, the second thing is um, it's been greatly encouraged and advised um, to be mindful. And mindfulness is um, pretty much, you can say, another word for Buddha's teachings. Um, so mindfulness is paying attention, close attention to present moment or paying close attention to how you acknowledge existence through your senses and you, how you find balance. Um, so we are encouraged to be mindful of our thoughts, speech, actions, and then of course um, our relationships and uh, beyond and above how everything comes to be. And the third uh, important thing about um, Buddhist teachings and practicing is meditation. All of these prayers and mindfulness is connected to meditation. And there are lots and lots of meditation, Buddhist meditations, um, loving kindness meditation, uh, meditation on compassion, meditation on forgiving and wisdom. But at this crisis time, it's been greatly advised and asked us to practice um, inside meditation. Um, that is, I'm sure all of you must be knowing about, at least heard about Vipassana meditation. Um, it's been greatly advised to study, or if you're doing it already, to practice more and go into depth. So um, insight meditation is all about being mindfulness, uh, being mindful about um, the body, uh, I'm sorry, the structure and the function about body, the thought process, the sensation, and all phenomena. So being mindful, uh, we are looking into the transient nature of all phenomena, how they arise and passing away, and uh, how the causes and conditions, infinite number of causes and conditions comes to be, to bring a phenomena to be. And when we, take things personally and when we get attached and make a story out of this arising and passing away transient phenomena, how the human suffering come into be. So by practicing more and more, we see how universal at birth, death, um, aging and diseases and waves of um, situations like what we are going through now or the subtle situations how universal they are. And our minds are becoming calmer and calmer and we have clear comprehension, courage and strength to face our challenges, day-to-day -day challenges. Um, and anxiety is part of that. Anxiety is arising because of fear and because of the uncertainty. And be mindful and pay your, when you bring our attention to the present moment, you are pretty much away from that fear and you are right here right now and then you have clear mind to see what needs to be done now so this is very short um introduction of what i wanted to tell you thank you thank you Aruni. um let me remind the audience if you have comments please share those through the chat button and if you have questions please share those through the q a button we now call on reverend jim newby Thank you, James. I want to begin by uh, sharing a, a reading uh, from a, um, a Quaker from an earlier. Excuse me, Aruni, would you, would you please mute? Sure. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> thank you. I want to begin by sharing a reading from a, a Quaker from an earlier generation, a man by the name of Thomas Kelly, uh, who wrote a, a beautiful book called A Testament of Devotion. And he wrote these words uh, in the midst of World War II. He says, out in front of us is the drama of persons and of nations, of seething and struggling, laboring and dying. 
Upon this tragic drama, our eyes are all set in anxious watchfulness and in prayer. But within the silences of the souls of persons, an eternal drama is ever being enacted in these days as well as in others. And on the outcome of this inner drama rests ultimately the outer pageant of history. Throughout their history, uh, the inner drama is something that Quakers have sought to pay attention. Uh, we know that it is uh, this inner drama, a drama that is constantly in, in need of nourishment, uh, that uh, will help us find the peace uh, at, in this time of anxiety that, that we see. I'm going to be very practical here and just share some of the ways uh, in which I try to nurture my inner self, uh, which uh, have grown out of my own Quaker tradition. Uh, first of all is silent meditation. Uh, since their beginning, the Quakers have learned that in silence we can commune with the living God. Uh, it is in this silence that we seek to connect with what we call the inner light uh, or the inner light of Christ uh, that can bring us peace. As a community, we gather in silence once each week, uh, but during this time of isolation, uh, this Quaker is, is meditating uh, every day, uh, sitting in silence, uh, focused on God's love uh, and on the world uh, that desperately needs uh, God's love. And so I seek to grow spiritually and find that peace uh, in a world filled with anxiety. Uh, secondly, I, I do what I call simmering walks. I love the word simmering. I, it's, a, it's a word that, that uh, I've taken from Howard Thurman, uh, the former dean of the Marsh Chapel at, at Boston the University. Uh, but each day I try to take a simmering walk where I can think about those persons uh, that I love where I can uh, focus myself on the world uh, that is struggling and all of those persons affected by COVID-19. Uh, during my walk, I wrap these persons and our world in the light. I, I literally take my hands and, and hold them out in front of me and wrap these persons uh, and our world uh, in the light and pray that God's love will surround them. I've also found that writing a journal is helpful. Uh, Quakers, uh, it seems, uh, they, they've been born with ink in their veins. Uh, they write journals. Um, thousands of journals have been written over the years. Uh, they share with others how God is working in their lives. Uh, many of these journals were written while Quakers were in prison for their faith uh, prior to the Act of Toleration of 1687. Uh, during this time of isolation, writing a journal, reflecting upon one's experiences and how one feels God working in his or her life uh, can be an excellent way to help us find the peace that we seek. And then finally, the, I find it helpful to uh, use queries or spiritual questions. Uh, Quakers are a non-creedal tradition. Uh, although we do not use creeds, we have queries which we use to help us grow spiritually. Uh, an example of some queries would be, how is God working in my life? Uh, am I careful never to wound the hearts of others? Do I avoid those things that distract me uh, from living a life with God? And so forth. Uh, and during this, this time of pandemic, we may ask, how is God at work in the midst of the pain and the struggle uh, in this uh, difficult time? Am I using my time and God-given gifts uh, to help others? Uh, Quakers uh, uh, like queries because they're helpful spiritual tools uh, to move us, re uh, to reflect upon our lives uh, and how we are coping with ourselves and helping others cope during this time of isolation. There's a, a painting in our meeting house um, that is titled, None Shall Make Them Afraid. Uh, and if you uh, go to almost any Quaker home, you'll find this painting. It shows a group of Quakers worshiping in colonial America uh, with a number of uh, Native Americans coming into the meeting uh, seeking to disrupt worship. Uh, instead of disruption, the Quakers uh, continued to worship unafraid, uh, relying on their faith to help them find peace in what could have been a very frightening time. Uh, and uh, I like to think that uh, uh, although the painting doesn't show it, they even invite uh, the Native Americans to sit and worship with them. 
during this particular time in our history, uh, when there is so much fear and anxiety, I hope that we can all learn to turn our faith, uh, turn to our faith, uh, where during these days we can find the peace that we need. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. If you'd mute, please. And I'd like to now call on Reverend Connie Simon. Thank you. As a Unitarian Universalist, we are, we are also a non-creedal faith and one that draws upon many different religions as sources of wisdom. And those include our direct experience of the world, science, rational inquiry, the words and deeds of prophetic people, as well as Jewish, Christian, humanist, and spiritual uh, teachings of earth-centered traditions. So in approaching these, these difficult times, in approaching the closures and the pandemic and the fear and the anxiety, for us, it's a question of remembering that we are still interconnected with the world. We are interconnected with one another. So when one of us is suffering, all of us are suffering. So my advice to my congregation has been to stay informed. Knowledge is key. To practice good self-care, control the things that you can control and understand the things that you can't to stay connected to one another and to help others as you can. And with those things in mind, I'd like to share with you a meditation that was written by one of my colleagues, Laura Mancoso. She calls it my, my commitments to myself. I take care of myself first because I am deserving of exquisite care. I take care of myself to maintain the capacity to help others. I move and stretch my body every day. I spend time in nature attuning my senses to the earth's wisdom. I ration my daily exposure to the news. I identify and access credible sources of information. I protect myself from becoming overwhelmed by information about the pandemic. I pace myself. I sit with the reality of uncertainty and impermanence and allow it to temper my desire for control. I listen without judgment to others' reactions, which may be different from mine. I forgive myself and others when stress brings out our shadow selves. I feel fear fully when I am fearful. I experience sadness fully when I am sad. I allow anger fully when I'm angry, and I relish joy fully when I am joyful. I seek out healthy pleasures and indulge in them without guilt. I remind myself that feelings are transient states that move through me. They do not last, and they do not define me, nor do my thoughts. I balance my drive for self-improvement with compassionate acceptance of myself as I am right now. I initiate contact with loved ones to let them know I hold them in my heart. I seek out with increased sensitivity those who are the most vulnerable. When possible, I share my resources with those who need help to survive. I move away from people, situations, and experiences that do not serve my highest good. I strengthen my connection to my sources of spiritual strength so that I continue to be replenished. I acknowledge the nearness of death as a key motivator for living a full life. I pray for the suffering of all beings to cease. I grieve my losses and celebrate my successes. I remain open to new ways of being, surprising sources of joy and unanticipated discoveries every day. And as I say to my congregation in all of our connections, I will say the same to you all. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay connected, and know you are loved. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Simon. If you'd please mute. I'd like to call on uh, Dr. Deborah Vance. Thank you, James, and greetings, everyone. I'm going to begin by putting my comments into a context. 
In the winter of 1853, the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith, Baha'u'llah, and his family were stripped of their possessions and sent into exile, and then finally to prison in Akka, now in Israel. Baha'u'llah's eldest son, Abbas, was nine years old at the time and wasn't freed from prison for 40 years. He took the name Abdul Baha, meaning servant of God, and in 1911 and 1912, in his late 60s, he embarked on journeys to Europe and North America to share Baha'u'llah's teachings. I've drawn from those many talks to share with you what brings me peace and hope in times of anxiety. So what follows comes from those talks. God's teachings are as a healing balm, a medicine for the conscience of mankind. They clear the head so that we can breathe them in and delight in their fragrance. They waken those who sleep. They bring awareness to the heedless, a portion to the outcast, and hope to the hopeless. The doors of the spiritual kingdom are open to all, and outside those doors is absolute darkness. Indeed, we see all around us proof of the inadequacy of material things, how joy, comfort, peace, and consolation aren't found in the transitory things of the world. Isn't it then foolish to refuse to seek the, these treasures where they may be found? If our hope is limited just to the material world, what is our ultimate goal? We mustn't emulate the worm that dwells in the earth that becomes its tomb. As spiritual beings whose purpose is to grow closer to God, how could we be satisfied with such a low aim? How could we find happiness there? Baha'u'llah teaches us to turn our hearts away from the world of matter and live in the spiritual world that alone can give freedom. When material anxiety envelops us in a dark cloud, spiritual radiance lightens our path. Those whose minds are illumined by the spirit of the Most High have supreme consolation. We should free ourselves from the material world and strive to understand the meaning of the heavenly world, the world of lasting qualities, of truth, of eternal kingliness, so that our life may not be barren of results, for the life of the material person has no real fruit. Our earthly task is to develop spiritual attributes that we carry into the next worlds. Humanity is bowed down with trouble, sorrow, and grief. No one escapes. But all our trials, sorrow, pain, and grief are born of the world of matter. The spiritual kingdom never causes sadness. Rather, living with your thoughts in this kingdom knows perpetual joy. This doesn't mean you won't suffer ills but that they'd only touch the surface of your life while the depths are calm and serene. We are all servants of God who has created all, provided for all, is loving to all. Inasmuch as God is just and kind, why should we be unjust toward each other? As God has quickened us with life, why should we be the cause of death? As God has comforted us, why should we be the cause of anxiety and suffering? Can humanity conceive a plan and policy better than and superior to that of God? And I'm going to close with a prayer of Baha'u'llah for healing. And I will just wanted to remark that his language in the 19th century, in 19th century Persian was um, high literary, and you will hear these and thou. So just to alert you in case that sounds old fashioned to you. And this is the prayer. Thy name is my healing, O oh my God, and remembrance of thee is my remedy. Nearness to thee is my hope, and love for thee is my companion. Thy mercy to me is my healing and my succor in both this world and the world to come. Thou verily art the all-bountiful, the all-knowing, the all-wise. Thank you, Deb. Um, a couple of questions that have come up, which is, first, uh, um, uh, uh, Reverend Newby, someone asked if you could share the name of the Quaker painting that you mentioned in 
the reflections. Yes, it, it's uh, uh, called None Shall Make Them Afraid. None Shall Make Them Afraid. Yeah. Well, thank you. And the other is uh, Doc, uh, uh, Reverend Simon, could, could you uh, share the meditation that you mentioned in your reflections? Reverend Simon, you're mute. Uh, mute. It's called My Commitments to Myself by Laura Mancuso. My commitment. I'll type it in the chat as well. I'll type it in the chat. So, so one one question I have for for each of the panelists is: um, Do you find we're we're now four six weeks into this uh, isolation and this new normal in our lives? Do you find that the anxiety among your communities is growing, staying the same, or becoming less over time? Um, uh, Bishop uh, Bridenthal, maybe you could could start. Uh, are, are we getting used to this or, or is it get growing worse for us all? Well, I would have assumed that it was getting worse, but in the last week or so, I've gotten a lot of um, emails and had conversations with uh, people in my diocese who are saying that they really favor uh, going slowly in, in terms of uh, opening up um, uh, loosening restrictions. And that, in fact, they have been, although they feel like they've been in a kind of fast from the sacraments, which you really cannot do in virtually, they're saying they've discovered the, the power of, of scripture and the power of community in a whole new way. So um, th that is a real balance for me from my own uh, fear for my diocese. I think, it, I think some, uh, some good spirit spiritually strong things are happening. And uh, Aruni Rapani, could you, uh, uh, Ma Rapani, could you please, with you in your community, how are they faring? Um, as far as I know, um, people are, t mm, they are hopeful. Uh, they find a lot of calm, uh, calmness and simplicity within them. And uh, they are all, pretty much the way I'm getting um, the space is limited and time is so much and how do you look within and within because we just cannot go out I mean any other time we would be going and volunteering and helping now we are we, we are just here now and um, so people are more into um, listening to each other um, inquiring about immediate relationships how do I feel about my husband? How do I feel about my wife or children? And it's all about self-inquiry. And they are, because so much, um, they are, the, the Buddhism is so much based on um, impermanence and people have hope. And they are also, um, we are supposed to contemplate on death every single day. And people are really practically doing it now. If that is going to be, are we ready? And um, there will be a day we will go out and do our uh, business. But right now, it's a great opportunity to look within. And that's how they derive strength. Yeah. Thank you. Reverend Newby. Well, I think I, if you know the Quakers, uh, I think that 90% of us are introverts. Uh, so we don't have the, near the problem that those of you who are extroverts have with regard to this time of isolation. Um, and I find that that we're, we seem to be falling into a rhythm in our community. Uh, we have a Thursday night um, time on Zoom where uh, it's just fellowship, just talking with one another, the kind of thing that we would do after meeting for worship in the fireside room uh, if we were meeting at the meeting house. And then, of course, we have our, our time of centering down, which is an adult study um, uh, time on Sunday morning, as well as meeting for worship. And our committees are, are continuing to meet via Zoom. Um, and uh, so we're functioning, but we sure do miss being with one another. I'll say that. And I think that um, uh, the longer that this goes on, the more uh, irritation we'll find within um, our, uh, uh, our people. And it's certainly being shown with all of these crazy protests and other things that are going on. 
And I think that uh, those are bound to increase the longer that, uh, that we're shut down. But uh, we're coping um, and uh, we take it day by day. Yeah, thank you, Reverend Simon. I think the same uh, is true for us in that people miss being able to be together. That's, that's the number one thing. Um, they are finding new ways of staying connected to one another. So we do have morning coffee Zooms and nighttime happy hour Zooms where you bring your favorite adult beverage and committees are still meeting and those things are happening. But I think that it has done two, three things for us. One is that it's exposed the privilege that we all have in terms of having our lives be exactly the way we want them and now we are inconvenienced. So opening that up to seeing the injustice that's in the world, it's exposed a lot of the economic insecurity that's just under the surface that people who you know, were doing fine by all occurrences now have lost income and the world crashes. So it's, it's showing us a lot of privilege. It's also generated opportunities for us to use our imagination and our creativity to do things in new ways. There are people in the congregation who, if I'd said a year ago, I'm going to post something on YouTube for you to watch, would have said, no, I don't do computers. I don't do Zoom. And now they look forward to those times. So it's, it's definitely um, opening us up to that. And with that, I believe comes a, um, an opportunity for us to make our faith even more accessible to those who would join us. It's so easy to go inside our buildings and say, here we are, this is our community, but no one else knows we're in here. But this pandemic, by forcing us to come out and be online and be virtual, has made us more accessible to people who either couldn't come physically or, you know, for distance reasons, whatever, weren't able to join us. So I, I, I am finding blessings in that. And and blessings to the earth in that the sky is clearer, the pollution is going down, the, the usage of fossil fuels is going down. So, um, yeah, so it's difficult some days. And I think that if we're open to it, we'll see the blessings that have come out of it as well. Yeah. And Dr. Vance. Yeah, I want to echo some of the things that actually few things everybody has said and also include the fact that we're structured because of the way we're structured, meaning we have no um, clergy. Uh, we can actually go anywhere and we are. So we are um, participating not just within our community, but within the Midwest region, um, visiting Baha'i events in other states, all on Zoom, of course. Um, we have international guests that will join us in devotions and discussions and um, study groups and so on, Mus and sharing music, music with each other and, and all that. So in a lot of ways, I think it's expanded. It's, we're insular, but in some ways we're more intimate and in some ways we're more expansive. Um, and I'm sure there are still all the personal anxieties, but we also can come together um and and work them out with each other so i guess you know same thing good and bad i think there are lessons that we're learning now being in this sort of um environment face to face but without food but there's lessons learning that we're learning that we can carry forward when we're able to get together physically again thank you but in closing let me thank the panelists for your reflections, your wisdom, and, and uh, what you offer us in terms of giving us some guidance in our own quest to find our own inner peace. And let me thank the audience who takes the time to join us on this. These, these have become very important for me personally because it's a moment of solidarity among the interfaith community uh, to come together uh, briefly on Sunday and for each of us to let each of the other communities know that we're there to help you. If, you, if there are things we can do, reach out because we are here for you. Um, I'd also like to thank Chip Herod, who is the director of Equation for his leadership in this, and Lisa Frankel 
and Ryan Craig for handling the Zoom logistics and getting this set up. I hope we will all keep those who are suffering uh, from this illness and who have friends and family members who are suffering and all those people who are on the many front lines um, who continue to do the work to keep our lives functioning to the degree that they are functioning. And I think we need to really keep them in our thoughts because while I remain isolated in my home, there are people that are taking care of things that allow me to do that. And, and uh, I'm deeply appreciative of that. To the audience, uh, please join us again next week. For those who have asked questions, we will capture those and we will respond um, directly to you. But please join us again next week uh, for, the, for the next one of these, which will be in, uh, entitled uh, Finding Courage in a Time of Overwhelming Fear. So everybody, please be safe. Please be kind to your neighbors and we'll see you again next week. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Lisa. So I don't think I can copy. I can't figure out a way to copy the questions. Just questions over, overline it and then right click and do copy and then just go to a Word document and do paste. Um, I can got, only I've do got, one at a time. I've got, I can do them all, I think. Can I mean, you do them all? I can't seem to. No, I can only do I can one. do all the chat. I, I, can, do, do I, can, do, I can do one, I can do one at a time on the, on the questions. Okay. Well, well I can do them. I'll just do them. There's only four questions. Yeah, and I'll answer one of those. But I don't know the things. I don't know how to get in touch with this person. Um, I would have uh, who Robert Pollock that no, one it's, or it's Nate, uh, in, oh N A D N online yeah. meditation mediation. Yeah. I'll find out what her. Find let out and let me know, and then I'll respond to that one since it was to me, and then uh, the other ones. Okay. Just send them around. Send them around to all the panelists, and then just let us respond. Sure. Well, okay. let's see if that. Yeah. Okay. So I can copy them. I'll, I'll just do one at a time. Okay. So you've got. Can I leave and you stay, or are you? You stay? can. Okay. Thanks. You're Lisa. free to go. Now have a good week. <laughs> Thank you. You too. Right. You know, some of us have to work for a living. Yeah, like who? <laughs> Anybody I know? <laughs> Me. I'm trying to, um, I was talking to, um, I was talking to um, Dr. Buchanan. Oh. He wanted me to, of course, this is now recording me.